Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our AI panel. I'm Lorena, and I'm excited to be the moderator for this AI panel, because AI is, is, is a bit close to my heart, having spent my early years experimenting with machine learning models. I'll just wait for everybody to sit down. Yeah? So, why do we need to talk about AI today? Why is it so important for all of us to understand better AI opportunities and AI risks? Uh, let me set the stage. AI is the hottest technology at the moment. But AI is not a new technology. AI is 67 years old. And if I think of the early years in AI innovation and where we are today with Gen AI, Gen AI is just one more step in this evolution, right? And in AI innovation, during the early years, the progress was quite slow, 50s, 60s, 70s, very slow. It was not until the late 90s that the machine learning appeared. And now we can plug those models into commercial applications for the first time to help us augment our capabilities on data analytics. Yeah, and we are still using those machine learning models and it, it enables us to help to get better at uh, predictions and to get better at decision making. So we'll have to wait some more years until deep learning appear and I'm sure some of you in the room remember when deep learning appeared, right? It's such a, such a scientific breakthrough. It was awesome, right? Because now we are able to understand and structure data sets. And not only that, large, very large unstructured data sets across artificial neural networks, deeper and deeper, more and more artificial neural network layers. And from deep learning, the pace of AI innovation just gets faster and faster. We go to transformer models, we go to GPT models, generative pre-trained um, transformer models, large language models, and Gen AI. Mitesh, Lokesh, AI innovation is really driving fast and furious. And, and that's why today I thought it was, it, was, it was just quite timely to speak to you both because you have such a great expertise with AI. So we'll, we'll cover AI innovation, we'll cover uh, AI pitfalls, challenges, and let me start with, with you, Hitesh. So, Nitesh, by the way, Nitesh is uh, the financial services industry lead for Asia at Google Cloud. And I wanted to, check, to, to kind of uh, ask you, what has been your journey in the last three to five years in experimenting, designing, and implementing with Google Cloud for AI? Thank you very much, Lorena. Whoa. <laughs> I'm assuming someone's going to change that because that's the way I sound. Oh my god! I'm going to do something about that as well. Give me a sec. Yeah, maybe this is not quite okay. There's some some AI at play here. I'm sure. I'm assuming it's no one else in the room. But well, firstly, thank you for having me here. Great, great to see all of you in the room. Uh, thank you again. We are not drinking rum. Someone asked us if we have rum in these glasses. Uh, two of us have lost our voice, so we've got some warm water. Um, Rob would have been good, actually, but uh, we'll save that for later in the evening. Um, AI and what's been happening with AI, I'll try and keep this brief. Um, I met a professor from NUS a few days back, and he, he made a comment about AI's evolution, which I thought was quite, quite apt. I mean, you mentioned it's been around for a while, AI, right? So his point was that um, AI has been around for almost as long as uh, artificial intelligence has been around for almost as long as real stupidity has been around. 
which I thought was uh, was quite insightful when you think about all the all the weird things we're doing to the environment. But coming back to AI, um, I think what we've seen is in the last sort of eight to ten years. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Big seat, guys. Yeah, what we've seen in the last eight to ten years is uh, really um, artificial intelligence uh, coming center stage. Um, and it's surprising, it's called heritage AI now. Well, you know, it was new to 10 months back, and now it's heritage AI. But I think the cool things that happened at that time were was pattern recognition. Right? Any Netflix users in the room? Yeah. A few, right? Um, it's awesome what Netflix does. There's no one Netflix product, which is consistent for all of us. I mean, we all wear the same shoes, it's the same product for everybody. Uh, or a jacket, it's the same product for everybody. But Netflix is a different product for every single person. And it sort of epitomizes what, what AI can do, which is personalize, find patterns. So I like something in particular, Lukesh likes something else, or Lorena likes something else. And Netflix will give you a product which is personalized for you. That was artificial intelligence, which was great, right? It did some really fantastic things for how personalization for all of us changed. And then came this Eureka moment of Gen AI, um, which is generative AI. And I was thinking to myself, why, why now? Why is generative AI suddenly so important? Right? What's, what's so different about it? And it comes down to the word attention. Uh, I don't know if anyone in this room has read the paper about attention is all you need. It was a Google paper in 2017. It was a fairly techy paper. It spoke about how models could have attention and therefore be able to do more. But if you take a human psychology view on this, nothing to do with technicalities, um, anyone try to make a make a booking on an airline and then try and change it? When you call the call the call center, they'll ask you to press eight and seven and zero and nine, and they're like, "I just want to speak with someone." Get on with it, right? Um, and I think what's happened in our digital world today is that we're all connected, but we're also very isolated. If you want attention from anything, you have a system to talk to, not people. What? Generative, generative AI has been able to do, I think, has been able to give that attention back to us as human beings, right? Um, and actually bring a truly uh, personalized experience for you and I. And it's just so user-centric that it's met this latent need and therefore that important. Now to answer your specific question, roundabout way to get here. What we've been doing at Gen AI, I mean, if you think about Gen AI, it's really four spaces that Gen AI excels in. The first is around uh, chat, which is obvious. Um, the second is around search, which I think is quite cool. I mean, a any Google users here? Anyone who searches on Google? Okay, well, assuming a few. Um, imagine bringing that Google search to your enterprise, right? I think there's you know various studies which suggest 60 to 70 percent of all our time as knowledge workers we spend finding the right information. Um, what if you had Google search at your fingertips? and an expert for you, personalized for you through generative AI. So that's the second big use case. The third is around content generation, which is, I think, quite cool as well. Marketing and ad tech and basically, you know, pictures for him would be different for me because we have different interests. So, you know, marketing works really unique. And then probably the fourth frontier, which is, you know, where the push is right now is around reasoning. Um, you know, we, we guys are gonna speak for 45 minutes or so. Hopefully you guys will ask us some questions. If you're gonna summarize that, you know, earlier somebody would go through notes and summarize all of that. Generative AI can now consume all of this, snap of a finger and it's all there. So it's a degree of reasoning as well. So these are sort of the four big areas in financial services, uh, and then I'll hand over to you, is uh, really, uh, you know, three big areas. Therefore, front office and personalization, I'm talking retail banking mainly, B2C business. Uh, there's a lot of push therefore because you know, Gen AI can enable that. The second big area is around middle and back office automation and driving efficiencies. So, you know, writing code, searching in documents, uh, and so on and so forth. And then the last area is around risk and regulation, where uh, we see a lot of impact around Gen AI. Um, so, yeah, that's sort of my point of view. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lokesh, you've been with uh, Standard Chartered Bank before you decided to move to the dark side and start your. Your amazing venture. Lucas is the CEO of Let's Bloom, yeah? And, and, again, and again, has an amazing experience on AI. So, so tell us what has been your, your journey with Let's Bloom with AI in the last three, five years. Sure. Hello. 
I, I think you can hear me. Yeah. Great. So, uh, Lorena, thank you, and uh, great to see all of you over here. So, my journey has been pretty interesting, right? I used to work within SC Ventures, within Standard Chartered Bank, thinking about how do we solve for high value use cases, not in a conventional method which would take three or five years, but rather really applying uh, you know, AI tech on these use cases. Right? The first one that we did, which, was, which had a very high material impact on the bank's balance sheet, right? was the use case around what we call open, right? it's the operating capital. It's really the bank's ability to predict what is going to be the balance in your account on a daily basis. What are the credits that are going to be there? What are the debits that are going to be there? Right? And it helps the bank because then if it's able to predict that with a very high level of accuracy, then it doesn't need to hold high quality liquid assets, which is very expensive. It can hold commercial paper, right? So there's a clear business case for that. The way we solved for that problem was very interesting. We actually looked at tech that was used in the medicine space, right? And that technology was called topological data analysis. It was from the 1970s. Right? And it's really saying, look, patients like these, right? These are the characteristics of these patients, and then therefore these sort of drugs can be uh, you know, implemented on that. And it was really good at clustering data. Right? And if you think about applying that same principle to a bank's book, it is saying, look, what are the customers who are similar, right? And how do you apply those learnings and then get to a stage where at an individual level, right, you're able to make these predictions and therefore have a real impact. That impact happens in terms of what can be lent to an, organ to an organization, right? So these, that was like the first large use case that I'm aware of in Standard Chartered that we did, which had a huge uh, impact on the balance sheet. At that time, the bank obviously wanted to do more. Right. And then it decided, look, we're going to do a number of POCs. Let's take more stuff into production. And that time we did a whole raft of POCs across business segments. Right. We went from doing 17 POCs in a year, four into production, to over 100 in a year, 50 into production. Right. So that was really good from an organizational perspective. But that also gave us the vantage point, right? especially myself, because you were, I was like in the middle of this. I was kind of the custodian for that, executing some, but also managing that portfolio. It gave us a great view into what are some of the challenges. So Nitesh has spoken a lot about the capabilities and the type of use cases that you can apply AI to. Right? But the first thing is, how do you get started? Right? How do you get started? Because a lot of these are cloud services. Right? And when you think from a bank's perspective, they're not just going to put their bank's data onto the cloud. Right? They're not going to do that until they've got the necessary control and the comfort right, that they're able to do that. So it was really about understanding A, the challenges, and why was it taking so long to execute these use cases. It was also a vantage point to understand how the you know, fintechs or the startups, how they were positioning themselves. They had some great feature function sets, but were not really thinking enterprise readiness in terms of where their product is to be applied within the organization. So that's how we really started. Right? We started our journey about three, four years ago. Right? And uh, it's been, we went live end of November 2021. Uh, it was, it's been, a, it's been like frankly a great journey. We got lucky, we got post revenue January 22, right? And it's been, it's been great. You know, one of, the, one of the key things that we saw as adoption grew for Let's Bloom is that a number of the technologies that uh, Nitesh was talking about, be it around chat GPT or an LLM model, be it around generative AI, banks are actually trying to use that. And what we've been doing is we've been creating the control so that organizations can actually leverage these technologies and do it in a way that is safe and secure, and they can actually evidence that to their regulators when required. So that's basically what our journey is doing. Thank you, Lukesh. Uh, thank you, Lukesh. So we have covered a bit of the past until today, and I would like to look a bit at, at the future and look forward for the next uh, couple of years so as we gear up to embrace the upcoming AI transformation, 31 billion are expected to be invested just within finance industry. Nitesh, how do you see banks, financial institutions, or, or even technology companies like Google optimizing these investments to maximize their AI strategy? 
Yeah, it's a bit of a crystal ball kind of question, right? Um, and I think what we can do is hypothesize. Um, so here's my hypothesis. So uh, maybe you can look at the hypothesis in two pieces, right? One is immediate term, which is sort of the next six, nine months, 12 months, and it's a space that's constantly changing. Um, and then look further beyond. So if you look at sort of the next six, 12 months, I think the trend is quite clear. What we've seen is that uh, large language models, everyone aware of large language models, right? Okay, great. So large language models have gone through this transition where they become bigger and bigger and more complex and more parameters. And like every day you open the newspaper and there's more number of parameters somewhere, right? Uh, lost track of which model has how many parameters now. But what's increasingly started to happen is smaller models have started to develop. So I think there's a general recognition that if you want sort of general knowledge, then you need large models. But if you've got to solve a specific problem, uh, let's say design new types of proteins for medicines, then you need a very specific. I've got to find who's messing up with this fight for me. Um, anyway, sorry, coming back to that thought. So, uh, smaller models being developed, ones which are more specifically thinking about solving problems which are relevant for a certain industry or a use case and so on and so forth. That's sort of trend number one, and I think that's going to continue. Trend number two that's going to happen is, um, and we're seeing a lot more of this anyway happen, is industry-specific large language models. Um, whether it's you know manufacturing where people are looking at designing new, new products or financial services where it's Track, uh, tackling risk and regulation and so on and so forth. So that's another big trend. And the third big trend, which is where you know people like yourselves, I think, will play a very big role, is the development of an ecosystem. I think there's a large recognition right now, um, and I don't mean that as a pun with large language models, that uh, AI and Gen AI has to work in an ecosystem, right? And developing those ecosystems is very important. So what I mean by that is that we as Google, for example, recognize that if there's a bank, Standard Chartered, uh, they will want to work with different types of models. And therefore, what they need is models that work in an environment, in an ecosystem with everyone. And I think Let's Bloom is doing an awesome job in bringing all of that together and having the right controls in place. So that's sort of short term. Now when you think long term, um, and this is again you know, looking into the crystal ball, but you can see that we're headed in that direction. I was talking about Netflix a little while back. That's you know data point number one. Products customized for all of us, which are unique to each one of us. Let me give you another data point, which is an analogy. So 2007, 2008, I think it was first when digital banking first came out. Do you remember the time when you first got an SMS? It wasn't WhatsApp, it was an SMS, which said, this is your balance. That was, that was awesome, right? I mean, you didn't need to go to a bank branch to check your balance. And fast forward six months, nine months, you could actually interact with it, you could say, um, you know, you could ask a query and then an SMS would come back. Most of the time it was cryptic, it didn't make any sense. But it was still cool, right? You didn't need to go to a branch. And then you fast forward six or seven years, 2016. I haven't been to a bank branch after 2016. Has, has I don't know, if anyone in this room, bank branch? Maybe to complain? <laughs> right? To complain, right? So, thank God I got that right. And no, I did not pay him up front. Um, so that's the world we're living in, right? The digital... Banking has changed the way we bank. Now, if you look at this as a second data point, and the first one of Netflix is the first data point, and then you and you think about where AI is today. Generative AI can make me feel, when I talk to it, like it knows everything about me. It's personal to me. And we already have this technology in place which, can, which is in production, not in banks, but in production and various other industries. Is it really hard to imagine a day when each of us have a digital chief financial officer and a chief investment officer in an app on our phones, which is personalized for each of us, right? It's, um, it's, it's really taking banking to, and life actually, to the next level where everything is super personalized to each and every individual. It also then starts doing more, which is filtering out things that are not important to us. We all get a lot of marketing material, some which is relevant, some which is not, most which is not. Imagine being able to filter all of that out. Imagine then that you connect, you know, I'm not wearing my health watch right now, but that watch knows more about us than doctors do. And then if you connect that information into your apps for banking, 
uh, into that sort of, you know, your, your CFO and your chief investment officer. It also then becomes your CEO. So that's sort of the space that, that we see technology and generative AI taking us in the next few years. Um, the, the key is that, you know, this is a developing technology. So, you know, I'm sure there'll be lots of folks in the road as this evolves. Uh, but this seems the general direction of personalization and really bringing that um, that degree of of uh, each of us feeling like we're getting attention from the organizations that we are interacting with. So that would be my take on this. Thank you, thank you, Nitesh. So thank you, Nitesh, for Let's Bloom. For Let's Bloom, what's what's the strategy in the next two three years? And similar to Nitesh, what's what are your predictions? Sure. I'm not sure I've got too many predictions from an AI or Gen AI perspective. Okay. I feel, you know, from a Let's Bloom perspective, what we're really focused on is enabling clients to, u to use these technologies, right? And it's going to organically evolve into the type of use cases that they can solve and the impact that it has, that, that it has on their business, right? That's really what our focus is. Our take on that is, you know, when we talk about AI models in a specific vertical, right, we call it context-specific actionable intelligence. For a particular context, because what the technology is doing is, it's giving us the ability to pinpoint. And for a particular context, right, come out with the controls, come out with the guardrails that are required. Similarly, right, as, we, as we do that, if I take a use case, right, if you're building if, if, you, if you're trying to predict fraud in trade finance transactions, that is going to be a very different sort of a model than trying to predict fraud on a low value retail payments uh, scenario. Right? So what we will see is I feel as AI evolves, as the capabilities evolve, because it's not there yet, at least I, I haven't seen a lot of that in action. Right? As the capabilities evolve, we will see super specializations. Right? And, and it is with those specializations where some organizations would obviously be you know, ahead than the others. So it's a great opportunity. It's also a great opportunity because now, as the model for banks change, and when I say about the models, what I'm really saying is, look, yes, banks do take deposits, do loans, give structured products. But what they're also doing is, right, they're now taking a lot more operational tasks for their sophisticated clients. What that means is they've got to be able to execute that. And they've got to be able to ex execute that whilst preserving their margin. Right? And that's why this is where the uh, you know AI, ML, generative AI, all of these capabilities would absolutely play an absolutely huge role. Thank you, Lokesh. So very interesting use cases. And now that we have heard all these AI opportunities, right, and what AI can solve for, um, with great power, right? because AI definitely is giving us great power, comes great responsibility. So we're now a lot of technology risk. I'm gonna ask you, because uh, I would like to touch on those risks, challenges, and concerns. So let's start with Nitesh. Nitesh, based on your experience, what are the key risks that you would advise us to, to be aware? Thank you, that was a bit Shakespearean, right? With great responsibility, great risk, and we're in a theater environment, so I'm almost tempted to stand up and perform. Um, no, that would not be the best side of me, so let me try this instead. Um, look, I think there are two broad categories. I think one would be biases, and the second would be sort of regulatory, right? So let's talk about biases first, and maybe I'll tell you a story. When um, YouTube was first invented, um, our team noticed something very, very cool with it. One, that of course it exploded, which was great for us. Uh, but two, about 10 to 20% of the videos uploaded on YouTube were upside down. The team was like, why, why, why is this happening? Why would people do that, right? And um, do any of you remember that time when we used to take photographs of those reels and develop them later? And yeah. you look at the reels in the darkness and not really know what you clicked. And you, know, you can't apply that logic to to these videos that people didn't know what the videos were, right? Because you can see a video. So why would people put them upside down? And people obviously, you know, the smart people in Google scratched their heads around it and then they realized the answer is actually very simple. About 20 to 30% people are left-handed. 
Most people who are left-handed, when they take a video, right-handers are this way, left-handers rotate the phone 180 degrees and then capture the video. And there was an unconscious bias, obviously, in the product when it came out to not account for that. Now that's you know, such a tremendous insight. When you think about it, um, that's what can happen with bias. Bias can actually completely ruin any product uh, that we bring out to market, particularly with Gen AI. Because any model, their world, the model's world, is the data that you feed it. And if that data has inherent bias, like the left-handed bias of YouTube, then you know it falls apart. So there needs to be, therefore, you know, structural ways of managing that. Um, you know, some, we take this really seriously. Um, some of the things that we think about are, hi, cool shoes. Uh, some, of the, some of the things that we think about in, in bias is really, firstly, making AI explainable. So if it makes a decision to give a credit product to you, for example, and not give it to me, then there has to be a specific reason as to why. Right. So explainability is very high on our agenda. Uh, and we're seeing that with customers. Second, there is a whole bunch of AI principles that exist now that you know, Google has sort of put out in the marketplace, but we are hoping that is adopted in the industry across the board, which, which takes into account how bias can be managed by making things human-centered and having metrics around data quality and so on and so forth. But third, obviously, thinking about unconscious bias, which is the left-handed bias we were talking about earlier with YouTube. Uh, and that's all about education, right? Because if it's if people don't think about unconscious biases that they hold, then you're not going to solve for it. It's a more difficult problem to solve. So that's the bias angle. The second angle from a risk perspective is thinking about regulation, where regulation is going. And there are already, in my mind, maybe three big areas. The first is safety. I'll tell you what I mean by safety now. Um, we were really honored and lucky as a company, Google, eight or nine of our products are used by over 1.2 billion people every day. Um, that is a lot of responsibility, right? I mean, it, if you think about it, there are people who start their day with Google Maps, and you know, if, if Maps sends them the wrong way, it could actually lead to injuries. Um, so the first thing that you think about from a from a risk perspective is managing safety of Gen AI. What if it hallucinates and gives you some weird, bizarre answer, um, and a consumer might not know whether that's right or wrong and consume it and act on it? So that's the first part, and you're seeing regulators address that. The second part is around fairness, uh, which is the point I was making earlier. You get credit, I don't. Why? Right? And can you manage those biases? And the thir third area would be around data protection, right? So if, you, if a generator model is taking some data about us, is that data used for what it's meant to be used for, and not, for example, for marketing or whatever else, right, without consent? So there's a lot of regulation that is coming in the space. I'm sure you guys have seen what the US recently announced. They've basically said everything is regulated. Uh, China is doing a lot with its AI model uh, regulation now. Uh, UK has finally also decided to include Gen AI in their, in their recent consultations, as is Europe. So I think these would be the key risks. Uh, I won't talk about tech risks because you know, cybersecurity and the others, I'm sure Lokesh will have a much more insightful response than I would. Thank you. And does it work? Yeah. And, and that's right. I, I know Lokesh because I've been with you almost from the beginning in Let's Bloom. I know that you guys are big in compliance and security. So I'm pretty sure you have it all figured out for technology risk. <laughs> Can you share with us some of those insights and, and how Let's Bloom enable the clients to have that compliance and security all figured out? Thank you, Lorena. Actually, Lorena has been wetting our controls and giving us a lot clear. So hopefully the controls are working. Uh, see, Nitesh has covered the, like, the free principle and, and you know, the sort of regulations that, the, uh, that governments are coming up with. If you think about how do we execute upon that, and when you think about the execution focus and when we talk about data, so data security, data privacy is a huge part. It starts not on the cloud, but it starts on-prem itself. Because largely organizations are still on-prem, they've got some data on the cloud. A lot of their transaction processing systems, especially in regulated businesses, are still on-prem. So it really starts with, hey, can I actually take my data to the cloud? What are, what are the controls that are there? Who can access that data? For what purposes was that data used? When they created the models, did they merge that with any external data? 
how do you give the full traceability? Like who touched that data? Right. How do you give the full traceability? So that every action that's coming up, you're able to say from a data perspective, that is how someone came to a particular outcome. Right. There's clearly a model validation step in this to pick up you know, uh, biases, whether conscious, unconscious, etc. But it starts with the data. Then these are, you know, some of the services that have come up, be it chat GPT or you know, and as we can call it a zero open AI, that's what enterprises are using. Right? Be it Google's Vertex, right? All of these services and the other cloud services that are being used, they need security controls around that. So you've got to make the entire landscape, right, secure and compliant and provide evidence on that on an ongoing basis. See, if you are unable to provide that ongoing evidence, then there is not enough reason for an organization to start using these services. Right? So it's a, it's a cash when you do, hey, I can't use a service because I haven't prepared controls for it. And if you don't use those services, you are not going to be competitive in your business. Right? So it's, it's very tough, where the business guys are generally saying, hey, I want to use X, Y, Z. I want to use, uh, you know, we've got a, uh, on, on a platform, Someone did a POC by for you by using LNM models, right? To ingest annual reports and then predict what the or not predict but actually state what is the amount of carbon footprint that an organization has. Something that took months could now be done in a day or two days. That can happen with LLM, of course, but it can only happen if you start. And the way to start is how do you have the necessary guardrails in place which allows you to execute on these use cases. So that's the, that's the approach that we've taken. So we look at it both from a cloud service perspective, we look at it from a data perspective, we look at it from an each individual perspective, the role or the persona, whether you're a data owner, a data contributor, a data operator, right? And we provide observability in real time to all our clients, right? That's, and to all of these personas. That's really what we're doing. And the whole point of doing that is that people are, or organizations are comfortable using these services and they can solve not one or two, but actually many more use cases. Thank you, Lokesh. So I'm going to go to the audience. Um, I'll give you just one minute while I do a bit of recap. If you can think of some questions for Ritesh or Lokesh. So we have covered, first of all, a bit of the past till today, and how Liz Bloom and Google have been through that AI evolution. Then we covered a bit of the future, right? and their strategies and what's next for both of them and as well the risk management because it's really important to be aware of those risks and of those challenges and we need to have those risk management strategies like Les Bloom for compliance and security. So I'm going to take a couple of questions. Anybody? So uh, <coughs> my name is Neil, sorry. Uh, I think I had a question for you. You're right, this was very loud. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's really loud. Um, sorry, my question was actually, because you earlier said something that was really interesting about how you could have a personal CFO or personal financial advisor on your, on your wearable or whatever. But I guess the question was around, it kind of leads towards, I suppose, a uh, open data kind of an ecosystem or world that you're talking about, right? Not just open banking, open finance, I'm talking about it's like different, but it's kind of the interconnectivity of all that data. So I guess the question is, and this is sort of the, on the risk side of things, like that—that that is, an, in some ways, an incredible utopia to look towards. I guess data privacy is a huge topic today, and how we are able to leverage that, right? And you talked about, you know, smaller LMs for very specific use cases, but in the retail space, for example, um, for example, health outcomes or health data, which with financial data, is intimately linked in many ways. So, is there a view on how that can be tackled? Uh, yeah. That's an incredible question. And I think one of the biggest hindrances for progress in this space, um, maybe I'll use an analogy to try and explain how we think about this. But open to ideas, I don't think there's any one silver bullet answer for this. Um, rewind a few hundred years back, right? Um, go back to the 12th century, for example. There weren't big cities. People lived in small little pockets, which were not even villages, 50, 40, 20 people lived together. And there was a lot of distance between people. And an ecosystem was just those many people living together. And then as you forwarded through the years, 
people started getting together in larger communities, hundreds, then thousands. And then we reached you know, the mega cities that we are in today, Singapore, New York, London, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if we imagine mega cities way, way back, people have said not possible. People will die of the plague. It's so easy for disease to spread. People would kill each other because that was sort of law of nature ruled the world at the time, right? Um, now, I'm not saying that data in today's world is in the same space as you know, little villages in the 1200s, nor am I saying that utopia will be mega cities where all data comes together. But I think it's not very dissimilar. Um, if there is a need, then sort of nature finds a way and so will business, which has always happened with humanity. Now that doesn't specifically answer your question as to how it will happen. This is sort of the philosophical side. The how is, uh, you know, people like Let's Blue putting guardrails and controls in place. So Lokesh's team does, ensures that things don't break as they are today and they don't break in the future. And there are multiple parties in all of this, right? There are cloud providers like us who ensure that everything that's on the cloud is safe and secure and people have the confidence to put more. Then there are users like you and I who put pressure on the system to always want more. Like imagine uh, going to a cinema to watch a film and not knowing which seat you're going to sit on and someone behind the counter chooses that for you. It doesn't work for us anymore, right? We put pressure on the system. And by the way, that's the way it was 20 years back, right? Um, we put pressure on that system to change things. So I think if you apply the fact that philosophically human beings move toward a better answer, to if you apply the fact that there are a whole bunch of guardrails in place now, and they're also forward looking to see that things will evolve in the future, but most importantly, as human beings and users, we continue to put pressure on the system, then why not? Right? And one example that comes to my mind, and I'm thinking off the cuff here, is insurance companies charging insurance premiums based on our health today. Right? That's, that's, that's become real. Um, about 12, 13 years back, that was a nightmare for the reasons that you mentioned, Neil. Um, but it's possible today. Um, and one would hope that it would evolve the same way. Thank you. Maybe we have time to take the as one more question because it's only five minutes left. Hi, thanks. I'll try to make this quick so we can at least do one more. Um, I had a question about regulators because earlier we talked about ecosystems. And if you think about the uh, deployment of AI across different banks, we are very highly regulated versus some cryptos or some fintechs. So what's kind of like the good, the bad, ugly of you know having very high, being in a very highly regulated environment? And in your insight, is there any best practice that we can do to kind of engage this type of stakeholder? So look, thanks, thanks for the question. Great, great question. I think having regulation is, is a net positive for the industry. It is only going to help people adopt AI at a faster pace. You see, not adopting is is like that's not 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 even an option anymore, right? And if regulated businesses which have, you know, tremendous amount of uh, customer data, right, if they are going to adopt these, they want to make sure that the regulator is at least saying, look, these are the guiding principles, right? Without that, they don't know where their risk is. So I think overall, uh, any industry which has had regulation, even in the past in history, right? It has only grown from the time regulation is coming. So I think from that perspective, it's a, it's a definite plus. The challenge has been, are organizations nimble enough to actually you know, build the necessary controls, do it in a fast way, so that they can start utilizing those, those services? I think there's a lot of room for improvement on that side. But Mass, for example, coming out with feet in the US where they've come out with these principles that they're saying, look, NIST, which is the National Institute of uh, Security and Safety, they are going to take a red hat approach. They're going to look at data privacy. They're going to come out with control statements on what uh, you know each organization should be doing. I think that's a great plus for the industry. Okay. So overall, I feel it is it is really about looking at how an organization wants to leverage these. I, I'd rather focus more on the use cases, which will generate tremendous value for the organization, and think about how we can leverage these services because. 
all the controls are available today, not just through Let's Group, through many providers, right? There are, there, there are people who, who do this for a living. So there's no reason not to use this, but the intent has to be there, the business case has to be there, and the organization has to then pivot and say, okay, this is, this is the agenda that we want to drive. I think we are at the cusp of that. We clearly see that because organizations are using LLMs. They are starting to use, uh, you know, in, in, in case of Google, like the Google Vertex services and the other services around that. We've seen that it's happening on our, through our platform. So I think that's a net positive in terms of adoption of AI. Do we have time for one more question? <laughs> Probably not. The question will be short. The answer might not be. <clears throat> um, it seems a little that Gen AI is a bit like blockchain, looking for a problem or looking for a use case. If it is not, can you give us an example live um, in production of Gen AI at use, if not in banking, then inside a regulated industry? I'll, I'll ignore the blockchain part, because the Gen AI discussion, but I know where you're going with this, Rob. But thanks for the question. Uh, just uh, maybe two quick examples. One is with um, HSBC. There is a standard chartered event, so it's good to talk about another bank. Um, the friendly neighborhood bank. Um, these guys are using um, uh, Google's artificial intelligence and machine learning, not specifically generative AI, but artificial intelligence and machine learning to uh, combat uh, uh, anti-money laundering. Right, so think about it, anti-money laundering is all about sort of looking for patterns in payments which look basically bad and catching those patterns and then predicting what to do with them. So they're doing this, it's really impacted their business in several ways. Anyone who's interested in details, I can share that with you separately. Um, we also have uh, at least three other banks that I'm aware of uh, across Asia Pacific uh, and several others across the globe who are looking at this one specific use case, which is all centers around 70% of our time as knowledge workers being spent to find the right information to do our job. So how can you look at uh, synthesizing and summarizing information from across the, across the org, but doing it in a manner that is explainable? So what I mean by that is if I go and log into work and I need to make a decision about giving a loan to you, for example, Lokesh, not that you need one from me as a banker, right? But just use this for this example. Um, Right? Um, I should, if I make that decision based on what generative I, is, so if I had a Google search within my organization, which is now powered by Genia, and that's the use case that banks are using, then once you get the result to say yes or no, then it actually tells you exactly where it's referenced information from to make that decision. So that's super powerful because you've got to be able to audit that and as a regulator, a regulated entity be able to talk about that publicly as well. So. These are sort of the broad areas. Happy to talk about more details. Thank you. So just 30 seconds, right? Uh, it's a wrap. We have <laughs> covered already more than the time. So thank you, everybody, for joining us today and for your engagement. And thank you for the great questions. And thank you to the panelists, which they have been amazing, as, as we were expecting, to share all the high knowledge with us. I'll just take 30 seconds only for a quick wrap up. I would like to wrap it up or do you see me taking some notes? I'll have again, yeah. With three C's. So all this journey is about uh, the first C, capability. Let's not forget our people. I know we are all technologists and, and we always think technology is the most important. But if we don't have the right AI workforce and the right people on the floor, nothing will move, right? So we may need to think as well how to upskill and reskill our people so you know we can ride this wave for the next five, 10 years. Second one, the second C criteria for success, right? Because I was just hearing from both of them talking about great use cases. So, so you know today, right, that there are countless investments in AI, but rather than investing anywhere, we need to know where we're solving for. What is our pain point? Because otherwise, you know, this also that clarity and that vision, criteria for success has to be clear. And last but not least, cultural transformation. Because it is just so important that we all understand about the fairness, the ethical, the accountability, and the transparency. And that has to come from within and with the leadership I aim 
yeah? So we can design, develop, and deploy responsible AI. Thank you again. Let's please give them a round of applause. Thank you to you guys. Thank you.